Thanks for joining this webinar hosted by Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, PRI. <coughs> Excuse me. PRI is a collaboration of more than 30 conservation organizations working to identify and take steps to resolve uncertainties in the process of prairie reconstruction so that future efforts are biologically diverse, ecologically functional, resist invasion by non-native plants, and are cost-effective to implement and manage. We do this by entering site <coughs> planting and management data into a specially designed database through data analysis, standardized monitoring protocols, and information sharing. And we deliver our results through a variety of formats, including webinars, field days, scientific journals, and a website currently hosted by the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative at tallgrassprairielcc.org forward slash issue, forward slash prairie dash restoration. The presenter for this webinar is Justin Meissen. Justin is the Restoration Research Manager for the Tallgrass Prairie Center at the University of Northern Iowa. Thanks, Justin. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, today, uh, I just wanted to share some of the work that I did in Minnesota uh, while working on my dissertation that um, looks at this question of uh, what the risks are to remnant prairie populations when we harvest seed uh, at large scale to use in restoration projects. Now, there's a, a growing awareness in both practice and literature that it's time to go from the site scale to the landscape scale in ecological restoration. Uh, but a big challenge in this is dealing with revegetation. And this is especially important in highly fragmented regions with little to no natural dispersal, like much of the Midwest where our tall grass prairies are. Uh, here we use seeds as the primary material to bring back those thousands of acres of vegetation. And they do a, a wonderful job of being easily stored and planted, as well as adding genetic diversity to restorations. Now typically, a lot of seed is needed to restore any area of vegetation. But prairies are especially uh, seed hungry, requiring up to about five and a half million seeds per hectare. So when a restoration is getting into the thousands of hectares, we're not talking about needing billions and billions of seeds just for a single project. So given that, it might not be a big surprise to learn that seed availability is a top constraint for tall grass prairie restoration. So how in the world can we get enough seed? So one option is nursery production, which is a great option if it's available, but it often isn't, especially if you're interested in using only local ecotype seed or rare species for your restoration. So an alternative to nursery seed production is wild seed harvest. And this is where either hand harvesters or mechanized harvesters like combines uh, shown here are used to collect seed from remnant stands. Now, generally in prairies, the sites uh, get burned in the spring to promote seed production and then harvested in the fall, as this uh, little schematic here represents. Now, wild seed harvest is appealing because it's, it's not dependent on native seed markets, it's efficient, and it can increase genetic diversity in seed lots. But despite all the benefits uh, wild seed harvest can provide, it might pose a risk to the prairies and species that we collect from. So when the seeds are collected, the ability of plant populations to regenerate is reduced. And if harvest is really intense or frequent, populations might not be able to grow or persist. Ultimately, this could lead to the decline and eventual species extirpation from remnants. And, uh, and those losses could compromise the resilience of the very remnants that landscape restoration often is intended in part to enhance. And what's more, you know, diminishing these already scarce native seed sources can make uh, restoration even more seed limited. Now one promising way to try to uh, assess and manage these risks is to use life history traits as a way to predict the response of species to seed harvest. So because seed harvest limits reproduction from seed, species with long uh, life history traits that are linked to reliance on seed for population persistence are going to likely be most at risk from overharvest. And so one of the key strengths of using an approach like that uh, is practicality. 
So in theory, life history-based approaches are generalizable uh, to all species, regardless of taxonomic classification. And trait data often are, are pretty readily available in existing databases or, or floras. Um, or if they aren't, they can be relatively easily measured in the field. So to get at this uh, broad question of what the risks of seed harvest are and how to manage them, um, I conducted a series of studies, each one looking at a specific question related to the overall aim of the research, uh, taking a little bit of a different approach to answer each one. So here's our roadmap for today. We'll be asking uh, these three questions. So do life history traits predict the susceptibility of species to seed harvest? What's the role of life history in determining the long-term risks of seed harvest? And how can we, um, how can seed demand for landscape scale restoration be met sustainably? And then for each question, we'll, we'll look in depth at a study that sort of gets at these answers. And then we'll finally wrap uh, things up and sort of synthesize what we learned. And then I'll give some, some guidelines based on all these results. So let's take a look at our first question. The do life history traits predict the susceptibility of species to seed harvest? So theoretically, seed harvest should impact some species more than others based on their life history traits. And to see if this is the case, I conducted an observational study of prairies throughout northwestern Minnesota. Um, and if you want to get more in-depth on this, I'll point you to the article I published in Restoration Ecology um, on this study, which, which lays out everything in, in more detail. And that's at the bottom left of the screen there. Okay, so to answer this question, um, I, I conducted retrospective prairie comparisons with these three main objectives. So we wanted to evaluate the differences in plant composition among prairies with different histories of seed harvest. Uh, and identify harvest sensitive species, and then identify predictors of harvest sensitivity. So I selected prairies to compare from a pool of about 50 remnant prairies with different harvest histories, but similar past land use and soils. So these sites were scattered all across northwestern Minnesota, so I blocked on latitude to control for differences uh, related to climate. Um, what this uh, resulted in was three regional blocks with six prairies each, and then in each of the regions, two of those prairies were frequently harvested, which was uh, they were harvested every year from 2000 to 2011. Two infrequently harvested prairies, which were harvested every three to five years from 2000 to 2011, and then two that were not harvested at all. So once I selected sites, um, I recorded species presence and identity. Uh, seedlings, vegetative individuals, and flowering adults in uh, randomly selected sample points. And then in order to predict harvest sensitivity, I looked at life history traits that reflect how reliant plants are on reproduction from seed, which of course is what's getting removed during harvest. So I chose uh, these three traits pertinent to seed harvest, lifespan, clonality, and fecundity, and assign trait values to the 60 most common species um, in my sites using published literature and trait databases. So here you can see I used uh, lifespan with uh, attribute classes of approximately one to five years, 10 to uh, five to 10 years, 10 to 15, and more than 15 years. And then um, clonality was considered either present or absent based on vegetative reproductive structures. And finally, fecundity or seed production was estimated using seed weight, which was taken from trade databases. Okay, so what did we find? Well, first off, uh, we did find some differences in diversity. So in the top figure here, we've got harvest frequency on the x-axis and then uh, species richness per quadrat on the y-axis. Standard error is uh, error bars. Um, and you'll see that there's not any difference in the unharvested compared to the infrequently harvested sites, but the frequently harvested sites definitely had fewer species. And then I also found some differences in community composition. So I used Mantel tests, which um, showed that indeed harvest frequency was related to community differences, but uh, other environmental variables were not or were controlled for during the uh, sampling designs. 
So the next objective is to identify harvest sensitive species. So using ANOVA contrasts, um, I found 14 species that were less abundant and frequently harvested compared to unharvested sites. Um, now I'm not going to read this long list, but I want to bring your attention to some of them, uh, Vizia, Thelictrum, Gallium, uh, which were much less abundant. In fact, they tended to be about half as abundant in the frequently harvested sites for quite a few of those. And then I'll also call out uh, Rebecca Herda, so Black-Eyed Susan, uh, which will make several more appearances throughout the webinar. So keep that one in mind. So we identified these harvest-sensitive species, but um, is that harvest sensitivity predictable based on life history traits? So to answer this, I use logistic regression, which can tell you how well different variables predict an outcome. And in this case, I use traits as variables to predict the outcome of whether or not a species was observed to be sensitive. And it turns out that lifespan and clonality were indeed predictive traits, uh, but fecundity was, you know, not so much. So you can see that a short-lived non-clonal species is quite likely to be sensitive, whereas a long-lived clonal species is quite unlikely to be sensitive. So 75% chance of sensitivity with that first uh, short lifespan and only 10% with 15 plus years. So let's sum up. So frequently, but not infrequently harvested prairies are different compared to controls, and those differences are uh, related to seed harvest frequency. So out of the 60 species I looked at, 14 of them are sensitive to seed harvest um, and short lifespan and non-clonality predicted sensitivity. Now on the flip side, 46 species, most of which were clonal and long-lived, were insensitive. So to answer the overall study question, uh, yeah, life history traits do seem to predict the susceptibility of species to seed harvest, again, where short-lived non-clonal species are sensitive to annual harvesting. Okay, so now let's move on to the next study. And so the second question here is, what's the role of life history in determining the long-term risks of prairie seed harvest? So the first study provided some evidence that um, life history predicts the risk of seed harvest. So now I need to verify that. But there's also a question of long-term risks. So that first study was only able to look at 10 years of harvest. Um, so what are the, the risks involved with the longer time frames that we need to um, for these really large uh, scale restoration projects? So to get uh, at these issues, uh, I did a modeling study using stage-based matrix models to simulate different seed harvest scenarios. And again, I'll point you to the lower left-hand corner here to, uh, to check out the new paper um, that was published based on this particular study. So my approach to answer this question was to simulate a variety of seed harvest scenarios using stage-based matrix models, and then compare the responses among species with different life history traits. So basically, a comparative survey of seed harvest responses among species with different life histories. So this study had two objectives to verify the role of life history in determining seed harvest response and to assess the long-term risk of population extirpation for common types of grassland plants subjected to different harvest regimes. So let me kind of walk you through the modeling framework that we're using here and outline the method. So the first step is to build stage-based matrix models of representative populations of species with varying life history traits. Then the next step is to simulate seed harvest on these populations by limiting the reproductive transitions to new seedlings. And finally, the last step is to project these populations into the future under several different seed harvest scenarios and then compare the resulting projections among uh, the different species under each scenario. So if you're familiar with the other study that looks at this question of seed harvest impacts, you'll notice this framework is really pretty similar to the one that uh, Eric Menges took in, in his 2004 study. So let's, uh, let's take a look at how we carried out each step. 
So the first stage of the modeling framework is to construct the matrix models. And it's this uh, first step, um, the first step in that is to select which species to model. So selected six species with a range of life history traits common to um, to the northern tall grass prairie ecoregion, and species that were sensitive or insensitive in the first study. So in particular, it focused on clonality as the life history trait of interest, where uh, clonality is defined as whether a species is able to reproduce vegetatively. So you can see that the model species are four non-clonal species and two clonal ones, where the blue shading denotes the non-clonal species and orange uh, the clonal ones. And again, keep Black Eyed Susan or Rebecca Herta in mind as we continue on. The next step in model construction was to build life history diagrams based on literature relating to each species population biology. So you'll notice a good deal of ver uh, variety here um, with the life cycle, the simple life cycle of Packer aureus to the more complex Lytris with a, a dormant stage, and then you also have the clonal life cycles of Anemone and Solidago. So once the basic life history template was created, the, um, the last step in creating these models was to estimate the transitions between the stages. So I used existing matrix models to do this if they're available, which was in three cases, but mostly I estimated the transitions based on other literature. Um, they gave me clues about fecundity and survival for each stage. And so while these species that I modeled were common, they're not always well studied enough to fully parameterize a model. So to fill in the data gaps, I use data that was available from the most phylogenetically and functionally similar species I could find. And so this tended to be from grassland species of the same genus. Now once the matrix models were fully parameterized, I then subjected the model populations to five seed harvest scenarios. So I used the Ramus Metapot program to simulate seed harvest by reducing the seed reproduction transitions in the models by either 50 or 75% every year or every three years. So this allowed me to look at how the populations responded to both increasing frequency and intensity of seed harvest. So I conducted a thousand runs of each scenario for each population and then compared two things among the resulting projections. Uh, the finite rate of increase, or lambda, uh, which is a measure of population growth, and the projected extinction risk over 25 years. And it looks like lambda might not show up for us. Oh, looks good. Okay. Now, I'm, uh, I'm only going to walk through three scenarios here, but I think they're quite representative of the others. So this is the baseline scenario, so no harvest. Um, so these three pop these uh, populations are all near a hypothetical carrying capacity and are under no pressure from seed harvest. So on the x-axis, we have time, uh, 0 to 25 years. And then on the y-axis, um, seems like a, get a little loss in translation while I updated it to, uh, to WebEx. But that is abundance um, the, of the population through time. And the light blue bars are showing the standard deviation uh, in the average through time. And then the red squares are showing the min and max values of the simulation runs uh, at each time step. So what we see here is that all the populations look good to begin with. Um, essentially, there's no extinction risk and um, growing populations, that is uh, lambda greater than 1. And so uh, here there aren't really any differences between species. So let's look at the triennial 50% scenario. So harvesting 50% seed every three years. So what we see here is no increase in extinction risk and um, no significant decrease in population growth over the 25 years. However, one thing uh, that we do see is that harvesting every three years um, introduces some oscillation in population dynamics, especially in the non-clonal species. So Rebecca especially. Now, what's interesting here is that the degree of oscillation is different 
in the clonal and non-clonal species. So this seems to suggest that the non-clonal species are more reliant on seed for their populations to persist, while the non-clonal species, or while the clonal species rather, are not so much. So Rebecca, with large oscillations, um, shows a high reliance on seed for their population persistence, whereas Saladego is almost entirely unchanged. And this behavior holds when we increase the intensity to 75% as well. The uh, only thing that changes really is the degree of oscillation, which increases, but populations sort of all still remain stable. And when we increase the frequency to annual harvest, but keep intensity at 50%, we also get a similar result in terms of growing stable populations, but without the oscillations. And then we have the high intensity, high frequency scenario. So this is harvesting 75% of seeds every single year. So now we can see really increased extinction risk for all but one non-clonal species, whereas we've got clonal species that are still looking okay. And we also see that populations on average now are declining over this time frame, which is to say that lambda is less than one, um, with all except one non-clonal species showing um, negative population growth. Now that species, Packer aria, is interesting here because we saw earlier that it was dependent on seed for population growth. However, since its initial growth rate was so high, uh, 1.67, um, even this harvest scenario doesn't cause the population to decline. But overall, what we see here is a, is a high, harvest, high risk harvest regime for non-clonal species, but a low risk regime for clonal species. So to bring all these scenarios together to see what's going on in just one place, uh, here's a summary of extinction risk and changes in population growth. So on the x-axis are the scenarios, and on the y-axis we have extinction risk. So one of the key results here is to see the big increase in extinction risk um, when we increase harvest frequency rather than intensity. So for example, in the triennial scenarios, uh, increasing intensity from 50 to 75% doesn't have a very large impact on extinction risk, but increasing frequency at 75% intensity comes with really extreme increases um, in extinction risk. So to sum up the differences in population growth among scenarios and species, I think the best illustration is the high intensity, high frequency scenario, where we see a really high decrease in population growth among the non-clonal species, um, which is a loss of 0.42 in the finite rate of increase, compared to barely only 0.05 in the clonal species. So that given that on average, populations started out with a growth rate of around 1.35, that's a very stark contrast in response to high levels of seed harvest. Okay, so here are the main takeaways from this modeling study. First, we saw the, the same patterns in life history differences in harvest response as we did in the first study. So that gives us some further evidence for the predictive ability of life history to determine seed harvest response. In terms of the long-term risk of uh, seed harvest, clonality seems to play a significant role in determining that risk. So we saw in the projections that even in the high intensity, high frequency scenarios, the population growth in clonal plants was really barely affected at all. Um, so what this tells us, I think, is one, that clonal species are not reliant on seed for population persistence, and two, that they can rely on vegetative reproduction to, to a degree to compensate for loss of seed reproduction. So the bottom line seems to be that clonality provides a buffer to negative population growth when harvesting seed. The next is a uh, next takeaway, I think, is the non-clonal non -clonal plant populations are at risk of extinction and especially decline under high intensity, high frequency harvest scenario. So the 75% annual one. In this scenario, we saw a high loss of population growth in all populations uh, with an average loss of 0.42. So I think what this is telling us is that seeds are essential for population growth in non-clonal plants, which makes sense since it's their only means of reproduction. Kind of on the flip side, the non-clonal plants are not excessively susceptible to declines with harvest. 
So we saw that most seed harvest scenarios didn't increase extinction risk, and nor did population growth become negative. So that's what we saw in both the low intensity scenarios, uh, the 50% harvest ones, and also in the high intensity, low frequency scenarios. So there's certainly a safe level of seed harvest for all these species, which for, for these uh, common prairie plants was about 50% in the models. But also we saw that by staggering the time between harvest, the higher intensity seed harvest can be achieved safely since um, those unharvested years allow the population to rebound. However, um, it is important to point out that some risk still remains in these scenarios as we saw in the previous slide. So while the risk is small, it does still exist. So let's move on to the last question. So the question here is how can we meet seed demand for large-scale restoration sustainably? So now that we've established some of the risks of seed harvest, let's take a look at how we can manage that risk. So to do this, I undertook a field experiment manipulating seed harvest intensity for several species with different life history traits with a specific focus on um, at-risk, short-lived, non-clonal species um, for, for this study was uh, Black-Eyed Susan or Rebecca Herta. So this study was uh, also published recently. Um, this one was in EcoScience, so take a look at that one if you're interested in the bottom left. Now the objectives of this study were threefold. So we want to continue to verify the predictive ability of, of traits uh, by testing uh, experimentally whether the short-lived non-clonal plant is um, similar, indeed sensitive to seed harvest. So the next objective is to evaluate the sustainability of seed harvest uh, at varying intensities in a harvest sensitive species. So now up until this point, we've uh, been looking at managing risk from seed harvest from the perspective of limiting harvest itself. But if there were a way to increase seed production, then that would allow us to obtain large quantities of seed that we need uh, for landscape restoration, uh, even with low harvest. So the third objective is to assess whether we can use management and fire specifically to promote sustainability of seed donor populations. So this study consists of a large field experiment comprised of planted prairie four populations where I subjected those to multiple seed harvest factors. So this experiment was installed in 2003 and is ongoing at Spring Prairie which is a remnant tall grass prairie in northwestern Minnesota. Um, and the site's pretty typical of prairies that get harvested for seed throughout the tall grass prairie region. So what this experiment consists of are many populations of nine individual plants uh, planted into established prairie. And by planting them into established prairie, the uh, populations get subjected to interspecific competition and climate conditions that their wild counterparts encounter in other harvested prairies. And that makes this experiment more applicable to science, to practice in particular. So this experiment is ultimately set up to compare seed harvest responses for species with a variety of life history traits to comprehensively test the ability of traits to predict harvest response. So I selected six species common in the northern tall grass prairie ecoregion, and together they comprise a spectrum of life histories that allows us to specifically um, to specifically uh, test whether non-clonal short-lived life uh, short-lived species are susceptible to population declines with uh, seed harvest. So on the on the right is a list of species established, and for short-lived species, we've got black-eyed Susan, Canadian milk vetch, and tall cinquefoil. While for the short-lived species, we've got common milkweed, metal blazing star, and silver leaf scurf pea. And you'll notice that among uh, short and long-lived species, at least one of them is clonal. But since there uh, had only been uh, three growing seasons for the experiment when I was finishing up this work, only the shortest-lived species were able to be analyzed at this point. So the focus today will be on Rebecca Herta, like at Susan, uh, which matured very rapidly and has set seed several times. So in terms of experimental design, uh, 
Uh, this is a split plot experiment with eight replicates where um, I'm manipulating fire at the, the whole plot and harvest intensity and harvest frequency at the split plot. And what that means is basically that I vary burning of large blocks of smaller plots that get a certain combination of harvest frequency and intensity. Now in terms of the treatments being applied, um, I'm varying fire frequency at either none or burned annually. And that usually happens in April before the growing season. And then for the uh, harvest frequency treatment, I'm harvesting not at all every year or once every three years. So finally, for the harvest intensity treatment, um, I'm using a brush harvester shown on the lower right to remove 50% of the seeds from populations and a mower shown in the upper center to remove 100% of the seeds by raking out the cut seed heads after they're cut. So, um, and we're doing these treatments right as the populations are starting to set seeds, so early to mid-August. Now, since it's too early to analyze the effect of frequency, given there has only been a handful of growing seasons, we're focused today on uh, harvest intensity as the key factor. So let's look at the results here. Um, so what seed harvest intensities might be sustainable? Uh, first, let's focus on seedling recruitment. So on the figure, we have seedling recruitment rate on the y-axis, and the x-axis, we've got each of the harvest intensity treatments. So error bars are 95% confidence intervals. So seedling recruitment rate here basically is the proportion of seeds that successfully transition to the seedling stage. So the first thing to see is the proportional decrease in recruitment as you increase harvest intensity. Now we're also seeing here that statistically there's not a significant uh, difference in recruitment between unharvested and 50% harvest intensity. Um, but with high harvest intensity, we essentially have no recruitment. So we were seeing that high, high intensity harvest effectively prevents any recruitment from seed. Now the other important thing here is what these recruitment rates, rates translate to in terms of seedlings. So looking at the mean seedling densities in populations, um, there were tons of seedlings in the no harvest treatment. So even in the 50% harvest treatment though, we're still getting a lot of seedlings. So remember we started out with only nine plants, so 128 seedlings translates to you know really high population growth even assuming you know, relatively high mortality in these seedlings. If we uh, compare this value to other studies that look at seedling densities in uh, sort of typical prairies, this value is a lot higher than those. But seedling densities are exceptionally low when harvesting at high intensity, so only about four. And four seedlings is not going to provide the sufficient base for those populations to continue growing especially if there's um, any mortality in the seedlings. Now let's take a look at whether fire promotes sustainable seed harvesting. So the figures here are seed production and burned and unburned treatments. So on the y-axis we have estimated uh, seed production, which is based on seed counts from individuals and a few destructive sampling plots. And then again on the x-axis here are seed harvest intensity treatments. So error bars show 95% confidence intervals. Um, the top figure shows the response to burning, while the bottom one shows the response without it. So with burning, we have big increases in seed production, and then on average, burning more than doubles uh, that seed production. So what's really interesting uh, here is to see the comparison between the burned low-intensity harvest and the unburned high-intensity harvest. So with burning and harvesting 50%, we could actually get about as much seed as harvesting 100% without burning. The other important thing is that fire, uh, the other th important thing that fire does in the context of seed harvest is create better conditions for seeds to establish as seedlings. So I found that uh, burning decreased litter cover from essentially complete cover, 98% more or less, to, to 28%. And it's certainly not a groundbreaking result, but it does show that burning also creates um, a reliable pathway for seeds to establish as seedlings, which is key if the seed donor populations are going to be sustained um, while being harvested for seed. So less litter, seeds have a much better chance to reach the soil and establish.
So let's recap the key findings of this experiment. So first one, um, as predicted for a short-lived non-clonal plant, found that uh, black-eyed Susan, Rebecca Herta, was sensitive to high-intensity harvest. And it demonstrated that the mechanism determining sensitivity was restriction of seedling establishment. So again, giving us further verification for the utility of life history traits to assess the risk of seed harvest. Next, I found that 50% seed harvest was a sustainable intensity that allowed high levels of seedling recruitment. But I also found that 100% harvest intensity was totally unsustainable given it, it nearly entirely prevents regeneration from seed. Last, uh, found that fire uh, plays an important role in promoting sustainable seed supply and stable donor populations. So burning doubles seed production and promotes favorable conditions for seedling recruitment. So not only does burning increase seed available for harvest, but it also promotes uh, seedling establishment, which is of course essential for seed donor population growth. Ultimately, what that means is that incorporating burning into seed harvest regimes um, results in a win-win scenario for both restoration and conservation. So finally, let's wrap up here and synthesize some of the findings of my research and talk about some guidelines. Once again, just to recap, um, life history traits predict seed harvest intensity, uh, seed harvest sensitivity. And species with non-clonality and short lifespan traits are the most sensitive. And this was supported throughout the observational modeling and experimental studies. So it's reasonable to conclude that uh, life history traits do provide a useful framework to assess the risk of seed harvest. Next, annual seed harvest, especially at high intensity, is a very risky practice long term. Um, but if we reduce harvest frequency to once every three years, most of the risks can be mitigated. The evidence for this mostly comes from the modeling study, but it's also supported by the observational study where I found that prairies harvested once every three years were the same in terms of abundance of harvest sensitive species as uh, unharvested prairies. And then finally, combining management with a moderate seed harvest regime promotes source sustainability. Uh, seed source sustainability. So findings from my experiment in particular showed that burning can nearly double seed production and increase the chance for seeds to establish the seedlings. So ultimately, that helps increase seed supply for restoration while still harvesting at low sustainable levels and allows um, the seeds that do remain after harvest to contribute more effectively to population growth, which benefits conservation. So by combining everything that we've learned from this research, I think uh, I could provide some wild seed harvest guidelines for tall grass prairies that are going to allow for sufficient seed to supply large restorations, while at the same time conserve ecological integrity in our remnants. So the first thing I think we can take away from my research is that existing harvest guidelines are probably a bit over conservative. So for example, one of the most cited harvest guidelines suggests that 10% of seeds harvested every 10 years is ideal. Um, my findings show that those rates would certainly minimize the risks to donor populations, but such low harvest rates really wouldn't be sufficient to supply any large-scale restoration. Rather, I suggest that harvesting 50% of seeds every three years after burning is, is really a better seed harvest guideline for prairies. So if practitioners follow this guideline, extinction risk should be minimal, but at the same time, considerable quantities of seed should, uh, should be able to be made available for restoration projects. Um, and we know from the observational study that harvesting every three years is sustainable and from the experiment, we know that 50% harvest intensity is sustainable, even for the uh, most at-risk species. Now, the modeling study confirms this for the long term, too. So 50% triennial, that scenario did not increase the extinction risk or cause uh, population declines in any species. Now, even following these guidelines, it is important to monitor harvested populations, especially for short-lived non-clonal species. 
So by developing monitoring protocols focused on at-risk species, harvest regimes can be changed if the abundance of seed donor populations drops. So monitoring allows harvest regimes to adapt um, as to avoid adverse effects of seed harvest. So with that, I have to thank all the people who made this research possible. Huge thanks to my collaborators, Meredith, Sue, Joe, and Bob. And then I have to uh, thank all the seed harvesters who gave me access to their records, um, their prairies, and info on their techniques. Um, and a ton of people helped with logistics. Um, and that's been a huge help with the harvest experiment, providing equipment and manpower to do uh, harvest treatments. So at this point, I'd love to take any questions that you might have. Well, thanks, Justin. That was good information. Um, and I do have a couple of questions. Um, first one says, what time of year are you focusing on burning? So um, so typically when we're talking about burning uh, for seed harvest, we are uh, talking about spring burns. So um, that can be typically um, a, a typical uh, early spring burn, or you d what you don't want to do is, is uh, burn too late. So when things are starting to green up, it's you know you're you're running into issues. But typically spring burns. Okay. Uh, next question is, what are some examples of short-lived non-clonal species? Yeah. So let me um, run this this uh, see if we can run the slides back to uh, that. Uh, um, that uh, list of them. Um, I'm sure, of course, uh, Rebecca heard us, so anything that's uh, a biennial or um, any kind of annual, uh, Not we don't have too many annuals in prairies, but um, another short-lived species uh, is the uh, Pacara, uh, or the golden ragworts, the prairie ragworts. Um, so those are also short-lived and non-clonal, so those are particularly at risk. Um, let's see if we can't get a little closer here. Probably getting pretty close to the uh, that list here. There it is. So um, yeah, so those are the the main ones, and this is the um, the list of all of the uh, species that we found that were observed to be um, uh, harvest sensitive. Oh, great, thanks. That'll be a handy list to have for folks. Um, next question. Um, I may have missed it, but did you look at harvest timing within season, thinking about plant maturity timings? So we did not look at harvest timing. Um, we had to typically mirror what happens out on the landscape, and that is harvesting typically in September. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a potentially important part of, of all of this is that uh, the timing could have uh, impact. So if you're harvesting seed earlier in the season compared to uh, the typical sort of um, uh, practice, which is later in the season, you'll be collecting different suites of species. Um, and even some of those early species will hold on to their seed for quite a long time. So Zizia, uh, Golden Alexanders is a good example of that. Um, if you look at seed tests and, and of, of seed that's been harvested late in the fall, not late, but in the fall, you'll, you'll find plenty of Zizia if it was there. So a lot of those early season species will hold on to their seed as well. So um, that's another factor that we haven't looked at, but could you know impact the, what we what we'll expect to see in different uh, harvested prairies. Okay. Did your demo, did your demographic models include interannual variation in seed production? So our uh, models did not include interannual variation. Um, so t we tried to, so we had to sort of make some assumptions about um, how we're modeling variation. Um, the way we uh, looked at stochasticity in this model was based on population sizes. So, of course, when you model, you have to have, um, you're basing that on individuals, and sometimes that those calculations don't necessarily um, add up to those actual 
integer numbers, and so you have to make um, some rounding decisions, and those decisions can make a, a much bigger uh, impact with small populations. So, so we did include demographic uh, stochasticity in the models, um, but as far as variation in the seed yields, we did not do that. That's sort of often a sort of a criticism sometimes of uh, of matrix models is that there is there is an assumption that seed output will remain stable throughout time. Okay. So clonal species population numbers were not adversely affected, but what do you think about the possible effects on their genetic diversity at high levels and intensity of harvest? Yeah, so the the issue there is, is definitely a, a very long-term issue, especially with uh, um, a lot of these clonal species typically are long-lived as well, so the the generation times are are long, and so we're we're talking about real long-term stuff, which which is I guess not to to minimize it, but but yeah, there's definitely a potential for um, you know eroding the sort of genetic variation in some of these populations, especially in isolated remnants of um, of these clonal species as well. Um, mostly we're just trying to look at this, at least for these studies I was sharing, um, looking at the, the sort of medium term, which is the that sort of 25 year horizon, which is the time span of, of a long term restoration project. So I guess I would say any kind of annual harvest you know, it, it really is going to have impacts long down the down the way. So, um, so typically you want to try to avoid annual harvest, even if it's, um, it's for sure for a long period of time. Um, if it's just for a project base, that you know would mitigate the risk. So, what differences, if any? you expect to see between harvesting seeds from remnants versus reconstructions? So uh, one of the, the differences, of course, in, in remnants and reconstructions is, at least in the terms of the timing when you're harvesting, is uh, the sort of the relative abundance of different species. I think we've all seen re restorations go through you know certain stages. Um, I think that it would be important to probably try to avoid harvesting a restoration in its early years, mostly because um, so many of those early season species are reliant on seed, of course. So, um, I mean, and we, we, we don't see those species at those high densities, you know, later on, but they typically are still in the restoration. So we want those to persist. I think we're, we don't want to, we don't want to over harvest in the, in the early, early couple of years when they're, sort of uh, producing a seed bank and, um, you know, producing the population size that they'll need to persist long term. Okay. Did you control for management differences among prairies in your initial study? Um, so we controlled as much as we could, um, made sure that none of them were grazed. There was, you know, land use history was similar. Um, the the one difference that we did have was um, fire frequency, so that's um, correlated with. I mean, that's directly correlated with you know the harvest frequency, since every time that you harvest, you're also burning beforehand. So so that's sort of inextricable. Um, so that was uh, something that we did try to do our best with, but um, there is still that issue with with fire frequency. Um, being correlated with seed harvest frequency. Um, I will say, though, that our experiment showed that was not important. So um, even if it was something in the observational study, um, the experiment showed that seed harvest, as you know, regardless of fire, was a bad, uh, you know, at, at high, high harvest levels was reducing, uh, reducing harvest, or uh, sorry, population sizes. If you were involved in any installations, how were seeding rates calculated with mass harvested seeds 
assuming chaff was left with the seed material. So can you see that one again? Yeah. If you were involved with any installations, how were seeding rates calculated using mass harvested seed? Uh, you know, assuming that the chaff was left with the seed material. Right. So that's yeah, that's really tough to to try to to get a handle with. You can send out um, seeds tests. Uh, of bulk harvested material, it's typically pretty expensive, and you get a really only a really rough estimate of what is in your is in your bulk harvested material. So, um, so there is um, I believe there has been some work done with uh, bulk harvest and um, seeding rates at Nachusa grasslands. I, I believe I think I ran across a paper uh, looking at that. I, uh, doesn't come to the top of my head what that is, but so yeah, there's it's it's hard, I guess is my and I don't I don't have a a good example of of how to um, overcome that. I think it's a an important uh, direction for research in the future. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, next comment. Uh, this is good measured data. Practically, seed harvested seed harvested scale is pretty inefficient, leaving much seed in the field. I'm wondering if we have much to worry about at all in this regard. Would you comment? Um, yeah, so so that's part of the import. You know, that's that's definitely valid um, that we are leaving a lot of seed out there. Um, but I guess regardless, my studies were looking at the you know it wasn't necessarily uh, very specific percents being harvested except for the uh the experiment. So the observational study showed us that um you know that the uh the even though we were not harvesting every single thing when we were harvesting every year, that was still pretty detrimental. So um still worth taking a sort of a risk averse approach and um also uh, definitely monitoring. I mean, that's sort of the key here. If you're not, if there's no monitoring going on, you can't really ever know what the, um, the impacts are. So, okay. monitor. <laughs> definitely. Next question. As you mentioned, the guidelines I've been told by many to protect the source population is 10% for perennials, 5% for annual, 1% for sensitive or protected species. Do you have some thoughts on annual collections at such low rates? So annuals, um, they definitely are theoretically the most at risk. Um, one thing that this that my study is not able to look at, and a lot of studies really, it's pretty difficult to uh, think to measure, is the seed bank. So annuals are typically uh, highly reliant on a seed bank. So um, and Harvesting can deplete the seed bank, and that would be sort of a, a masked uh, effect that you wouldn't see until it's too late. Um, so I think annual harvest levels should be pretty low. Um, I would say that what I have presented here with even so, like Rebecca Herta is a biennial, short-lived perennial. It can be an annual, but it's that's not its typical sort of um, life history. Um, so what I was presenting here, I think, is would be not conservative enough for annuals. We only have a few prairie annuals. It's not a super common uh, life history in, in tall grass prairies. So, um, but I would say, you know, definitely lower than 50%. Um, and again, sort of depends on the population size, but 10% is um, is likely to be a safe. Um, a safe uh, amount based on some of the other studies out there. Okay, so as I read the question, I think what was being asked is collecting on an annual basis rather than collecting annuals. Oh, okay. Yeah, avoid annual harvest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so again, the, this, uh, the question said that what this person heard would be you know, protect 10% for perennials, 5% for annuals, and 1% for a sense of protective. So thinking about those numbers on an annual basis. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, those would be those would be fine. I would 
for those are such low um, amounts that that's almost, it's really unlikely um, to be um, to be a significant impact on those populations unless there's something else really going on um, that's making their uh, populations decline with respect to seed reproduction. So those those sound safe to me. Okay. Um, so in study one, you had a timeline of 25 years on your x-axis. How did you measure seed production among species that far back? So yeah, so that was the model. Um, so that was, um, so we were modeling that, and so we were saying that seed production, you know, we were um, using estimates from the literature uh, on what those, uh, what the seed production was, and then so we have, we're just sort of uh, making that assumption that we typically have to make you know, a lot of demographic studies that what you find in one year is a pretty good average, pretty good representation over a long time scale. Okay. And the final question is, um, Commandra umbellata was listed as a vulnerable species. Did you really monitor this species? I understand it takes 17 years for seed to germinate. So yeah, so Commandra was a um, species that we found to uh, decrease with harvest. Um, so we didn't necessarily, with this observational study, uh, determine cause and effect. Uh, we sort of observed that the um, that the annually harvested praise had less of certain species, which we showed earlier. Um, so, yeah, so Commander Umbalata may have been decreasing um, even though that, you know, some of the seeds were not germinating. I think towards the end there you might have some um, some die-off, you know, you know, general mor mortality um, in any given year would sort of catch up. And if the seed reproduction part of that wasn't... Uh, you know, keeping pace then uh, at the uh, amount that it should, then that would sort of uh, show up in the population sizes. Um, so even though it may be, you know, 17 year uh, in the in the ground before it germinates, you know, theoretically before we harvested, there would have been still quite a lot of seed in the ground that was germinating. And so if we're preventing that, you know, uh, we might be picking that at least in the the early stages of that population decline up in the in the study. Well, that's all the questions. So, um, Justin, I want to say thanks again for presenting that. Uh, it's a you know interesting topic and certainly something that's important to a lot of folks out there. So, thanks again. And um, any last comments? No. Uh, thank you again. Um, I had a had a good time presenting. Thanks. Good. Well, hope we can uh, find a reason to get you back on on, a, on another webinar later on. Excellent. Thanks, Justin.